firm believer that uh, if you go into someone's house, you can tell a lot by them by what they have displayed, whether it's on the walls or uh, on the shelves. You know, if they have a lot of family photos, they're, you know, they're probably very family-oriented people. Uh, to, you know, they have sometimes these uh, different sayings and so forth that are uh, plaques on the walls. Um, just, you know, you can tell a lot just by you know, walking into someone's home and seeing just, you know, just where their heart is and where their mind is uh, by the things that they, that they have up. And uh, such is the case with uh, a, an elder that we had in the congregation um, before this one. Um, his name was Ansel, and you've probably heard me talk about Ansel. Um, he was an invited elder. over once, and above his television was a placard. And I've never seen anything like this. But the placard said this, above his TV of all places, how dare we be entertained by the things that sent Jesus to the cross? He wasn't, it was not certainly a, uh, you know, he wasn't throwing shadow to the, you know, to having a TV in and of itself or even some of the programming and so forth, but I knew where he was coming from and that uh, there are a lot of programs that are on television that we see and a lot of things that are in entertainment right now that are very contrary to what God wants us to believe, to follow and how God wants us to live. And so, you know, having something like that above the television, I thought was very interesting. There are a lot of things in this world, and we see a lot of it on TV because I think right now media is more widespread than it ever has been in the past. The Internet can show us things more than we ever knew uh, before. We can go literally to any part of the world and see just about anything that we want and see reporting on anything. There are also things that we should not be looking at on the internet. And uh, you know, when, you, when you start to consider everything that the world has, uh, there are some things that are very positive, there are things that are very beneficial and helpful, but we really don't need to look very far to see how distance that some of the nation, this nation specifically, has become. It's sad in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, it's good to see people, the, you know, the Christians, that there are still Christians in this world, that they're Christians in this nation. But we know that sometimes we just feel like we're fighting an uphill battle and we're trying to convert people and talk to people and get people connected to Christ and it just does us no good and uh, sometimes we can be discouraged about it. And it's the same kind of uh, thought, I think, the same kind of challenge that Isaiah had. And when we, you know, as we go through this series of looking at these different lessons of the prophets, if you notice the last couple of weeks, and we're going to look at it tonight and probably in the future, you know, there was the, one of the biggest obstacles that these, that these prophets faced was Israel and Judah and where their hearts were and why, you know, the, the reason why they went into captivity. So many of these prophets wrote about why Israel and Judah fell the way that they did. Now, there are some great lessons that we're going to be looking at, some very encouraging ones, uh, things that will hopefully help us. And when we look at lessons like this tonight, hopefully it will encourage us to want to do the right thing and not allow ourselves to uh, get caught up in the mindset of the nation and the world and so forth. But Isaiah did a lot of writing. We're going to be having a number of lessons throughout the series from Isaiah because there's such great information. This was a man with wisdom. He was a man that, who loved God, a man who loved his nation, but he was not going to love that nation above God. And so as we look at some different areas uh, throughout Isaiah's writings, there are some very uh, profound lessons that we can learn too. And, it, and we start with it in uh, chapter 1, which is where we're going to primarily be tonight. There are, you know, when, when, when Isaiah starts out his writings, there is a list that he reveals of these complaints that he has for Israel. And when you look at these complaints, just think about how each one, we're going to connect them tonight, uh, how each of these complaints that he has for Israel are things that we can actually, that we can probably compare and correlate to things that are going on in our nation today, the mindset of the people. And while we're not, we might not have the idolatry that they were faced with back then, there were things certainly that keeps our minds from connecting and putting God first in our lives and from where we should be with God. And there was a problem with them and how they looked at God. And so we're going to look at these in chapter 1, these, these different complaints that, Israel ha that uh, Isaiah has in setting up this, you know, you know with, with what he was trying to teach um, Israel and what he was trying to correct with Israel. And then there is some hope that he has 
at the very end of this chapter in which we'll look. But let's get into these complaints um, tonight that uh, he has for Israel and look at how each one of these can compare to the world that we live in today. And then what can we do about it? You know, because we can complain about the world, but unless we're doing something to try to resolve it, and, and you know, I get it, we can't, uh, you know, we can't solve everything. But you do talk about these things, don't we? We, do we, it, we care about these things that affect us in the world. And while we can't change everything, there are things that we can look at and say, okay, well, what can I do within the confines of what you know, I'm capable of doing? And I think every person has, to some extent, the capacity to change a nation. Not one person, but we can change certain things in a nation by changing certain people and getting certain people in hopefully the right mindset so that they are at least in the right place that they could be. We don't know what's going to happen to this nation we know that all, you know, that every dynasty that we've read about in the past, the greatest dynasties, the strongest dynasties have come to an end. And we look at this one, and we're relatively young by comparison to many of these. And so we can't think for one moment that this nation is going to stand the test of time, or that we're bulletproof in any way, because God's going to treat this nation just like he does every, every other nation. He doesn't hold this nation any higher to any higher standard. He has the same standard for every dynasty, every nation, every, you know, every, every, everyone that he deals with. And so as we get into these, you know, these complaints that Isaiah has, and it's sad that he has to complain like this, but it really is an eye-opener for us. The first complaint that he uh, has is how they rebelled against God. You look at chapter 1 and verse 1, and he starts it right off. He says, the vision of Isaiah. So this, is a, this whole thing that he's writing about uh, comes from this vision that comes to him of how he knows what's going to happen. This is a foretaste of what, you know, of what is to come because of the behavior of Israel. This is the vision of Israel, or of Isaiah rather, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. And so he's calling them to attention. He's saying, stand up, give me your ear, listen to what I'm saying right here. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Can you imagine that? God built them up and built, you think of the, the Jewish nation at this point and just how strong they had become. This was a nation, remember, we, we looked at this a little bit this morning of how, you know, we can't take these things for granted, just like Joshua you know, he couldn't, you know, don't take all of everything God has done for us for granted. The Jewish nation was included in that. God got them out of, out of Egypt, and he got them through the wilderness the way that they needed, and he put, took them into Canaan, and they conquered Canaan, and they divided the land, and then after the land, they had more things that they were able to do, and it led them all the way, and for a long time, it was, it was great. But then, of course, we know that uh, they started to go against what God wanted them to do, and then the judges came along. And then after the judges, you know, they were, you know, and they kept falling back, and then they would go forward, and they would fall back, and Isaiah finally, in God, has enough of this. He says, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. That must have been frustrating to him, to know how he, he had brought them up. And Isaiah was acknowledging this, and how they were, you know, they were built up, and he calls them his children. I know how frustrating it is. I've talked to parents, many parents, who have done everything that they possibly can to bring their own families up into the, in the church and bring them and nurture them in the church. And for a while, their children are more faithful than you could even imagine, and then for whatever reason, they're not. And those parents get frustrated. And you look at it in that, you know, in, in, in that context, and you realize just, you know, how, just, just how disheartening it must be for parents to see their children go through. Imagine God on a much grander scale to build up his people and then to see his people fall or to see his people just, all, just out and out turn against them. And God uses this in verse 3. It's very interesting that the comparison that he makes here and it's almost, uh, it's almost comedic if it wasn't so tragic. But listen to what God compares them to right here in verse 3. He says, the ox, you know, it says the ox knows its owner, 
See, this is why these people were rebellious against God. And then he follows and he says, the ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib. You know, it's interesting when he uses the ox and the donkey, because the ox and the donkey, when you look at it in the Old Testament and how they viewed it, were not the brightest animals. The ox was not, you know, these were animals that were known to be dull, and the ox was not, I mean, it was made for one thing and one thing only, and that was just to, you know, to plow. And uh, there's, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying that you've probably heard. Some people say, well, they're not, you know, they're not like that. But you hear that saying, dumb as an ox. And back then, they really didn't put a lot of stock into the, you know, these kinds of animals. A donkey was the same way. It wasn't known to be the, smart, the brightest animal. And yet here's Isaiah writing, well, the ox knows its owner. Even the ox knows who's over it. See, what he's saying right here, he said, these people are rebellious against God. The ox at least knows who its owner is. The ox knows at least who's over it. The donkey knows its master's crib, but Israel does not know. They say they, they're, you know, they know less than even a donkey does. My people do not consider. And so you think of just you know, how this comparison is being made right here. Hold your place right there and look over at Proverbs chapter 7. And we get another indication of just why, you know, just... just Maybe why this comparison is being used right here. Proverbs chapter 7, Solomon's writing this, and it's writing about this harlot that is in the midst of uh, seducing this young man right here. And in Proverbs 7.22, he writes, Immediately he, this young man, went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter. This young man, this harlot that's, you know, that's trying to entice him, he says he just goes after this harlot. Just like an ox goes to the slaughter. That's all it's, you know, it just, it, it follows it. He's not smart. In fact, he goes on right here. He says, as the ox goes to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. And so they did not put a lot of, they, they did not put a lot of, invest a lot into the brains or the mind of an ox or a donkey. And Right here, Isaiah is you know, telling them they are stubborn and more stubborn than these animals. Why? Because they rebelled against God. Why would we do something like that? When God builds them up and they know what happened when God built them up and how strong they could become, how great of a nation they could become, and for whatever reason, they just rebelled against him. And do we not see that in the world today? It staggers me how people in the world today just uh, how they have rebelled against God as well. And, uh, and schools are a big one. You know, I started thinking about this. And, you know, if you ever realize that, a, you know, parental consent is needed for a child for a field trip, they need to get that, they need to, you know, come home. And I remember when we went on field trips, we needed to bring the waiver or the, or the admission slip to home and our parents would have to sign it. And I remember having friends that, you know, wanted to go so bad and they couldn't go. And so what did they do? Oh, they forged their parents' name because they need that signature to hand into the teacher, right? Don't ever do that because that's not a good idea. But the, they would do, you know, we needed those signatures to hand in. Parental consent is needed for body piercings. Parental consent is needed to get a tattoo, Parental consent is needed, or parent, parental guidance is needed, someone with you, if you're under the age of 17 and want to go to an R-rated movie. Parental consent is needed if they want aspirin at school. You know what you don't need parental consent for nowadays? An abortion. You can kill your own child and not even have to go to your mom and dad and let them know you're doing it no matter what age, you, what age you are. Science is being taught in the most vulgar and vile way in public schools now, and I feel for the public school teachers who are good Christian men and women who are fighting against so much of this, and they have to be very careful because their morality is on the line, their job is on the line, and they have to work very carefully around the edges but they have to teach certain things in the school systems, in science classes, and how difficult that can become. And yet your child doesn't need parental consent for what they're really putting into the minds of our students. How interesting it has become in this world. 
to see the how we see the rebelliousness of this society. It wasn't always like that, was it? The second complaint is that they abandoned their God. You look at verse 4, and Isaiah talks about this. He says, Alas, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity. He's talking about this whole nation right here and how these, so many of these people have fallen away. A people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. Look at this. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. They've gone backwards instead of going forward and doing what God wants them to do and understanding what he can do for them and becoming more righteous. They take three steps back. And you, know, you look at that and think, well, you know, how does that compare to, you know, to the nation that we live in right here? Have you ever read the Declaration of Independence? It's fascinating. I think it's something that probably everyone should read at some point. I mean, you, you know, you learn a lot about your country that way, a lot about the ethics and what they had originally envisioned for this country and what a great country it is. We do love this country, love being here. But when you read the Declaration of Independence, it's really interesting. There's 56 signatures on the Declaration of Independence that include two future presidents, three vice presidents, 10 congressmen, and they have references to God in three different places. God as the creator. In other words, when they started looking at the, the very fabric of what this nation was going to be, they wanted God installed into it, woven into the whole fabric of what this nation has, is and what she was at one time. You look at it nowadays, the references, you know, people can sue someone for just mentioning his name in a right environment. Wasn't always like what, what she was. And that's what Isaiah was complaining about with Israel. He said, look at how God built you up and built you up. And you abandon him like this? You know what his law is. You know the things that he had in his law that would protect you, that would, that would enhance your spiritual knowledge and wisdom and character and integrity. And you turn around and you abandon him like that? Same thing happens in this nation here. It's amazing the comparison that we can have in this, in this world and what they had in that one. The third complaint is that they forgot their God. I mean, it's just, you know, just so many, all of these different factors are just, you know, they, they're floating around and just, you know, taking these and just, just looking at how these compare to our nations. You know, a nation who rebelled, a nation who abandoned God, a nation, and then a nation who forgot their God. You look in verse 7 and we see this. Isaiah tells them, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. And look at this next part. Strangers devour your land in your presence. Strangers are coming in and devouring land in the, right before your eyes. They have forgotten their God. You see, that wouldn't happen if they knew who their God was, if they could recognize him and remember what, everything that he did for them. There would be no room for these strangers to come in and do that. And yet these strangers come in, he said. These stra strangers are people they don't even know. And they come in with their, with their different ideas, with their corrupt ideas. He says, they devour your land in your presence and desolate as overthrown by strangers. These Israelites treated God as just you know, some tribal God. That's not who he was. God, he is God of the mightiest empires in world history. And he's the same God who has been through every single one of them, and he is the same God that is in ours today. This is the empire that needs to remember God. This is the dynasty that needs to remember who God is. This was a God who was frustrated with his people. And Isaiah is writing about it. You see, when the world's let in, God becomes obsolete. That's what was happening with them. 
And that's what can happen with us if we're not careful about it. The only place, the only place where God is really going to bless us is in Christ. That's where we need to be. Being in Christ is going to get me into heaven. Aren't we grateful that no matter where we are, the church of Christ is alive all over the world. And there are people who can be added to it no matter where they are. But that's the nation that God blesses, is the one that's in Christ. There's a fourth complaint that he has as well, and that is that they were hypocrites. You look at verse 10, Isaiah writes here, the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Wow, that's, a, that's harsh. He called his own nation the nation of Sodom. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of, of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? He calls, them, he calls Judah, Sodom, and Gomorrah. Folks, that, is a, that ought to be eye-opening. That ought to be a shot in the arm for these people. What would he say about us? He tells, you know, I mean, you think about it. He's asking, you know, why do you come to worship when you live these abominable lives? You do all of these things out here against me, and then you have the nerve to come and try to do, you know, to, to sacrifice all of these animals? How dare you? Don't bother showing up if that's how you're going to do it. You see, when we vow, make that vow to follow Christ, when we come up out of those waters, we are vowing that there is not one thing in that world that is going to keep a hold of me or that we're going to do everything, everything in our fighting power, every, every bit of energy that we can spiritually to put that world behind us and not have anything to do with it. In fact, the ones that we do meet in the world, we're going to try to convert them too because we want them to come out of it just as we were able to come out of it. But he says, why do you come to worship when you live these abominable lives? And look at verse 15. He goes on, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. And even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. And your hands are full of blood. What does that mean for us? See, God will not bless America if America does not bless God. We have a job to do. God's not patriotic. We can be, but God's not patriotic. God is sovereign, and he wants us in his kingdom. But God's country is his church. It's not any country, including this one. But I thank God every day that his church is doing the work that needs to be done in this nation. We need good people in the church to reach as many as we possibly can. We're realistic. We're not going to reach everyone. We're not going to make this we're not going to make this nation 100% under God. That's just not real. They couldn't do it in the first century. What makes us think we can do it now? There hasn't been any time where they have been able to do something like that, but you know what they could do? They did everything that they possibly can to change one person at a time because they looked at soul by soul by soul. There's only one thing that's going to provoke God to bless a nation, and we see it in verse 16 of Isaiah's writing, and that is, as he tells them, wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Think if we can just reach one person two people, three people. And if those, can re if those people can reach out, and they can reach some people. And then there we have a, a, a whole group on their way to heaven who never would have gone there before if they didn't. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil and learn to do good. You know, there's a lot going on in the world, isn't there? The world wants to be the standard. 
here's the thing. So does God. And he deserves it. A righteous nation is built one soul at a time. And it can begin with you. You can be the starting from starting today of being that one soul building up this nation. Folks, if Christ is not your first love, I want to encourage you to use this time to rededicate your life to him. Make tonight the night that you say, I am going to do, starting tonight, everything that I possibly can. I might have faltered in the past. I might have fallen short. I might have, I might have been in situations where I could have said something and I didn't say something. I might have been in a situation where I could have done where I could have done something and I regret not doing it, put it behind you and make tonight the night that you rededicate your life to Christ and say, I can't change everyone, but I can sure work on someone. Let's stand and sing.